so there's this guy, right? He's an employee, and he goes to his boss, and he tells his boss, he goes, look, man, you need to give me a raise. Like, I need a raise. I just want to let you know there are other companies that are after me. And he goes, what do you mean? He goes, like, who's after you? You know, they were good friends, so this was kind of a shock. And he goes, well, I mean, there's the light company, the gas company, <laughs> the credit card companies, and the phone company, right? So I need a raise, <laughs> right? Maybe you can relate this morning uh, to that. Stretched, we're, 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 why are we doing a series about finances? That's probably the immediate question everyone in the room is asking, right? Guarding their back pocket. All right, just relax. It's going to be okay. Um, there's a couple reasons why we would talk about this. In fact, churches and pastors are notorious for not wanting to talk about this because of the implications. And uh, at New Life, we're not uh, really concerned about that because, for a couple reasons. One, uh, because God has a lot to say about finances. All right? Uh, well, we're going to play a little game real quick. All right? Um, in the Bible, there are, how many verses do you think that the Bible talks about baptism? Just throw a number out. Baptism. How many verses? 30? 20? 60? 10? Wow, no. No one believes in that, okay? <laughs> 40 verses on baptism. All right? That's pretty, pretty decent. All right, what about prayer? How many verses do you think are on prayer? What'd you say, Meg? 700, okay. 750, anybody else? Come on. We got 30 minutes here. Fill me some. All right. 275 verses on prayer. All right? It's pretty good. All right, what about verses on faith? Where do you think we're at? 100? 400? 190? You said some, Angela. What'd you say? 500, okay. 350 verses on faith. Love, there are 650 verses on love. And guess how many verses that relate specifically to finances and material possessions? Thousand? I feel like I'm bidding something. Can I get 2,000? No. 2,350 verses that talk about finances and material possessions. So do you think the Bible has something to say about this issue? Absolutely. So that's the first reason, because God has a lot to say about it. That's why we're going to talk about it. Second, because the great majority of Americans uh, mismanage their finances. I've told you the, the horror stories of my family growing up, right, and just some of the mistakes that I made, and uh, I just remember that all too well, right? Financial problems are the largest contributing cause of marital stress and divorce. Um, the average credit card debt in a, in a U.S. household is $8,400. Some of you are like, yeah, I put that to shame. That's, that's, they got nothing on me. <clears throat> but think about this. It will take 54 years to pay off an $8,000 credit card balance at 18% interest if you make the minimal monthly payment. That is staggering. That is crazy. Our country is living in a financial uncertainty. 2.7 million people have lost jobs or settled for part-time jobs. Millions have lost benefits. That's another reason why we're going to talk about it, because it's important. And because we need to be taught. You know, some things, honestly, that we, maybe we should have learned from our parents, we didn't. Or maybe we learned the wrong thing, just to be honest. Right? But maybe we didn't learn what the Bible says about it. And that's what really matters. And the last one is because, or the, the third part is, is because money is a force that can be used for good or great damage. Good or great damage. <coughs> Some people mistakenly believe that the Bible teaches that, the, that money is evil. And that's not true. Money's not evil. The love of money leads to evil, right? Is the root of all evil. But money is neutral, kind of like electricity, right? Electricity is great. I love electricity. Who here loves electricity? Yeah? Amen. Right? Because you needed it to charge your smartphone so you, you know, when, the, when the, the time fall back this morning that you didn't get, you know, here an hour late or early, probably. All right? It's a powerful force when used. Riley can power your house with light, energy to your air conditioner on a hot day. Amen. Um, or run a respirator machine at a children's hospital. But when it's misused, it can, it can electrocute you. Who's, who's ever been zapped a little bit? Yeah. 
It's a weird feeling, right? A weird feeling. Uh, money is neutral, just like electricity. Uh, money can be used to build a facility like this, praise God for a building like this, to feed the hungry or, or to educate people or to take the gospel around the world. Uh, you know, I'm always enamored by uh, Brian Schmidt's brother, Mark. You know, he travels all over the place preaching the gospel on his own dime. He uses his own money to go and do that, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ in different countries. And I'm always, I love hearing his stories, right? Money can do that. It's a great resource. Or money can be used to buy drugs, create pornography, to pay someone to hurt another person. But money is not evil, but what you can do with it can cause great good or great damage. And here's the last reason we're going to talk about this is because I want you to prosper in this area. I want you to be prosperous in every area of your life. And so there's two mentalities we're going to talk about this morning as we kind of kick off this three-week series. So for the next three weeks, we're going to be talking about this. And another reason why, as New Life, we, we specifically chose to do it during these months is because we know that everybody's about to go into debt, right, through all of this holiday season uh, when, we, when we kind of splurge and, th- and, and wait to think about it in, into the next year, right? What if we thought a little bit differently? What if we thought about what we did with our resources and, and how we managed our life in this next season? Because I don't know about you, but I know how it can be where it seems like my schedule doesn't become my own in these next couple months, right? It's all parties, family parties, company parties, whatever it is, overtime, um, whatever it could be. I, I seem to lose control. And the one thing is just like, I just need to get through it. Come 2020, we'll recalibrate and figure out how we're gonna pay for everything we just did, right? So, and also Thanksgiving is coming up. I think one of the things that we, we, we forget, and maybe the only time of the year that we actually do think about it is around this time, is just to be grateful for what God has given us. To be grateful for what he's placed in our lives. The ability to work. The ability to have income. However, we're getting it legally, of course, right? But thanking God, being grateful. And so there's two types of mentality I just want to kind of break this time with. <clears throat> the first one is the scarcity mentality. When I say scarcity mentality, does anybody know what I mean by that? Okay. So it's a way of viewing the world and its resources that believes that there is a limited amount and that there is typically not enough. The scarcity mentality. It's an economic principle in which a limited supply of goods coupled with a high demand of that goods, for that goods, results in a mismatch between the desired supply and demand equilibrium. Uh, we hear this a lot like in retails, right? In retail, they always want you to believe that there's only five left, right? You need to act now because this isn't going to last long. This is going to run out. While stocks last, while supplies last, this week only, last one, And scarcity is a principle known by all retailers who milk it right down to the last drop. If something is rare, I don't know why, but if something is rare, uh, it seems we we find it somehow uh, more desirable. I need to get this. I need to get this. There's only three left. And And a shortage of anything sends people scurrying to the shops to pick it up. To stock up, often fueling the shortage and keeping the spiral going. What about you this morning? Why should you listen? Why should we talk about this? Right? Don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to write how much debt you have and we're going to collect it and figure out how how much in the hole we are, right? But I'm going to read these. And if this applies to you, this is kind of a test for yourself, all right? Don't answer out loud, okay? I repeat, don't answer out, out loud, okay? I cannot rejoice in, others peop- in other people's success because their, their win equals my loss. I have a hard time releasing and giving because fear there will not be enough. I find myself competing and always trying to win over others. I compare myself to others a lot and my feeling of success or failure depends on how I rate. 
I live with the feeling that something bad is going to happen to me. I have a tendency to hoard and hang tight onto what I have because I'm convinced there is a shortage. If, we, if that's you, then maybe, maybe you have developed or have been operating with this scarcity mentality. Have you ever played the game Monopoly? Who, who's a Monopoly player here? Yeah, right? Monopoly. And I love Monopoly, right? It's a cool game. It takes forever. But, you know, you decide to play the game because you want to build, a, you know, for fun, right? Bonding and friendship. But the goal, the goal of the game is to make everyone else poor so you can win. Right? When you win, you win when you strip everyone else of what they own and you face them into bankruptcy. And we call this fun <laughs> or winning. It's twisted. <laughs> it is fun. <laughs> Scarcity mentality right there. <laughs> I told you, don't answer out loud. <laughs> Next week we're going to talk about listening. No, I'm just <laughs> But Stephen Covey goes, Stephen Covey is an author. I love his book. He has a book called Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. But one of, the, one of his quotes says this, most people are deeply scripted in what I call a scarcity mentality. They see life as having only so much, as though there were only one pie out there. And if someone were to get a big piece of that pie, it would mean less for everybody else. The scarcity mentality is the zero-sum paradigm of life. This idea that if I lose, if you get, then I don't get. So it, it, it puts you into uh, a frenzy. I remember um, a time when I was leading worship. I think I told you guys this story before. <clears throat> it just came to my mind. I was leading worship with my, my youth pastor for some youth retreat. And they were feeding us kind of like this family-style dinner. We, they fed us dinner while we were there. And so as soon as the food came, I just went after it, Right? I didn't care about anybody else, right? There's six of us sitting at this table, and I'm just going to town. And, pa and the pastor comes to me and goes, Eric, you know, maybe, maybe wait for everyone else to get some first, you know, and then you can get some. And I'm like, why would I do that? <laughs> I'm like, bro, if I don't grab this, I'm not eating, <laughs> right? That was my mentality. That was the only reason I did it, right? Because I grew up not having you know, these big extravagant meals. So, man, that was like a treat for me. But that's because I had that scarcity mental mentality. If you get it, then I don't. And that ain't happening. <laughs> right? I love food. <laughs> <laughs> right? But there's a different mindset. So that's the scarcity mindset. The other mindset is this, the abundance mindset. Don't get worried. I'm talking about no prosperity gospel here. But I am talking about the word Abundance. This is an approach to the world and belief that there is enough for everybody. God has designed a world where there is more than enough to go around. And here's the thing. Our mindset needs to change about the things we think we've obtained on our own. Think about all your stuff, good or bad, <laughs> your debt and everything too. Definitely, definitely own your debt, right? But think about all your stuff and we think that we've accomplished this. Me, myself, there's this uh, video I love of... Um, Castaway, right, with Tom Hanks, and he makes fire. Did you see, remember this? And he's like, I, me, I have made fire, right? And he's so happy that he made fire, like this big, huge accomplishment. Well, we walk through life thinking the same thing. Driving up in the parking lot in the car that we bought, right? Trying to send the message, trying to look the part that we're trying to play, maybe. I don't know. But we need to change our mindset on the things we think we got on our own. And for this, we're going, to go, we're going to be looking to the book of Exodus, chapter 16. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to go back to the book of Exodus. It's a great, great story of God's provision. I love it. God's provision. And, and, and we're going to talk about manna. And what, what does manna teach us about the scarcity myth? All right? And so if you're taking notes this morning as you're finding your place in your Bible, here's, here's kind of the big idea for today. <clears throat> when focused on God... He leads us out of the myth of not enough. When focused on God, he leads us out of the myth of not enough. All right, so we're going to pick up in Exodus chapter 16, and, and right now what's happening is 
pretty cool actually. Uh, Moses is leading the Israelites out of Egypt, right? God has freed them from the hand of Pharaoh. They're on the run. The Red Sea parts. They walk through on dry land and, and the water and the waves come against Pharaoh and wipes them all out, right? Pretty amazing, right? Pretty amazing already. And guess what the Israelites' response is? I'm hungry. I'm hungry. You should have left us in Egypt but we had food. It's pretty crazy. It's almost like children. When we pick up in Exodus chapter 16 um, in verses 2 and 3. And it says, The whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we have died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out to this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. I was like, oh my gosh, are you kidding me, dude? Really? Like literally, the Red Sea opened up. You walked in on dry land. He, he took care of your enemies. He brought, he got you, he freed you from captivity. And you think, you think food is going to be an issue. I read this story, I'm like, whoa, man. But I think all too honestly, we are these people who forget. Very quickly, we forget, right? Uh, the wilderness. I can't say that word without thinking about Nacho Libre. I was talking to somebody yesterday. You ever watch the movie Nacho Libre? <laughs> so every time I see, hear wilderness, I think of him. The wilderness. <laughs> but the wilderness is the ultimate uh, place of scarcity. The ultimate place. Of, think about it, right? A place where little grows, uh, where few people survive, and where life is hard. In the wilderness, in the desert. And this is where they're at. This is where they're at. So do they have what's in front of their eyes? Do they have appropriate reason to wonder about food? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because where they're at is a difficult time. No one's knocking that. But what, but what they're focused on is the wrong thing. See, when you focus on God... He leads you out of the myth that there's not enough. But when you're stuck in your circumstance, when you, all you see is what you see in front of you and you're focused on the lack of work or the lack of job or the lack of money or the lack of whatever it is, then all you see is the problem. And that problem brings you to a place of anxiety. It brings you to a place where you don't trust. It brings you to a place where you feel like you need to take things into your own hands. And can I tell you, that's a bad plan. And you see them. You see the Israelites being overcome with this scarcity mentality. And when the crowd starts loving, living like this, when the crowd starts chanting these things like, you should have left us over there. You brought us out here to die. It creates a culture. And it leads to them grumbling against God. They are doubting his work, longing to go back to Egypt. I, I read that and I am dumbfounded of how easily they forgot how easily they forgot. See, manna teaches us this. The first thing that we're, we see that manna teaches us. And so if you're taking notes, write this down. God is the source of our provision. God is the source of our provision. Uh, let's continue reading in verses 4 and 6. <clears throat> then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I, may, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. So this is a test. God's going to make it rain bread. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, At evening you shall know that it is the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. God is testing them, right? Uh, the people were in, were in the middle of the desert where scarcity uh, seems to be a way of life. There is nothing growing. There is no, uh, there is no plan or, or, or viable way that we can see logically of how we are going to import. It wasn't like God was delivering trucks of food for them. I was talking to my, my brother right before the service, and he was telling me about a conversation he had with a, a friend of his um, who's from Africa. And he was talking about how they pray and how they pray so hard that until they pass out. 
because there is no, uh, there is no food pantry where they're at. There is no uh, Walmart or, or you know, um, North American Food Bank. There is, no, there is none of that. All they have is when their kids are looking at them and they're hungry, they pray. Kind of reminds me maybe what this is like here. They're, they're in the desert. There is no opportunity. There is nothing happening. But God made a way. God shows them what to expect. He allowed manna to rain from heaven each night. So when the people woke up in the morning, it was there. And notice where it comes from. The provision that we get, it comes from God. He's teaching us this principle. What we need isn't isn't the product of these hands. It isn't the product of my intellect. Although God has blessed us, there's some very good-looking, strong, smart people in the room. But if we walk out this building think that it's on us and that everything we've accomplished is because of our own wits, then you've, you've missed the whole point. Then you don't understand. There's something about manna that you haven't learned. There's something about God's heart and his ability to provide that you have skipped. It came from heaven. And until we settle this issue in our hearts, in our mind, you're, we're always going to struggle with managing your money according to God's plan. This is why this mentality is such a big deal. That's why we're starting with this. Until you resolve this, until you come to the conclusion that everything comes from God. Then you will struggle with stewarding your money according to God's plan. Here's a couple verses I would encourage you to write down. They're not going to be on the screen. <clears throat> Psalm 24.1 The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and those who dwell therein. Who does it belong to? Belongs to the Lord. It's His. He doesn't just own the money, He owns the world. Psalm 89, 11. The heavens are yours. The earth is also, it also is yours. The world and all that is in it, you have founded them. James chapter 1, 16 and 17. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Everything, our provision comes from God. Our provision comes from God. You want to be reminded of that? When's the last time you were so sick you couldn't get out of bed? Right? You're so sick you couldn't get out of bed. You're just so tired. Right? When you breathe, your lungs hurt. You are unable to do anything. And if you're a male, you're even more of a big baby, right? We, we tend to cry about it a little bit more. Moms, like, they just go to work. That's what happens. They just tough it out. <clears throat> but in that moment, you're reminded, it's like, man, I want to get up. I want to do something, but I can't. I can't. Sometimes those are simple reminders. You can't. You don't. It doesn't rest on you. Don't be fooled. Don't be fooled. God cannot be mocked. And until we settle this issue that really everything comes from God, our provision comes from Him, then you will resume the ownership. Hear me. You will resume ownership and ultimately dishonor God with what He has given you to steward. If you really think that it's yours, I think about even my children right? My children, God entrusted them to me, and every, everything tells me I'm responsible, right? Legally, uh, you know, the school system tells me, everybody tells me, right? I am responsible. Really, this child belongs to the Lord. This child belongs to the Lord. I, I manage it. I steward him. I raise him up. I teach him in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, and guess what? One day the Lord takes him takes him to go do something that he wants him to do. And I don't get to choose that. I don't get to choose that. I don't get to control that. I don't own it. I'm a steward. We're stewards. 
So we have, to, we have to understand that our provision comes from God. The second thing that I see manna teaching us is that each day brings new provision and new opportunity. Each day brings new provision and new opportunity. <clears throat> Go down to verse 15 and 18, chapter 16. Verse 15 and 18. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? Right? They're talking about the manna that's falling from the heaven. They're like, what is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather it, each one of you, as much as he can eat. And uh, you shall each take an omer according to the number of the persons that each of you has in his tent. I think on purpose God didn't send, you know, like I said, these, these trucks of food, right? There, this was something that created a dependency. There, there, there needed to be a dependency on God. You know, lately, me and my wife, we've been, or for the most part, we've been really trying. Every day when we wake up, we just pray this prayer, simple prayer. God, don't let me forget how much I need you. Don't let me forget today how much I need you. My mind works a little bit differently. I see a need, and then I start thinking creatively of how to fill that need. I love that, actually. I'm a strategic person. I love to think that. I love to hustle. I love resource, you know, resource building. I love it. You give me a problem, I am happy to figure out a way. But when I rely on that, when that is my sole source, not a tool that God's given me to use, but it is, I'm, and I'm more reliant on myself than I am on God, then that's when it becomes a problem. So my prayer is, God, don't let me forget. Don't let me forget how much I need you. He didn't send trucks once a month. Each day they had to go out and look for that manna. Each day. It was good for a day. Think about that. It was good for a day. And each day brings new provision and new opportunity. I love, it reminds me of this verse in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Um, it says, is, it is the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Each day, the farmer goes out to work and he deserves what he earns, right? That's what the scripture is telling us. And even Jesus taught us to, play, to pray. And the way he taught us to pray was this. Give us this day our daily bread. One day at a time. I think about King David, and, and, and I'm going a little off tangent here right now, but King David, you know, he disrespected God when he made these plans. He, he talked about, oh, you know, I think I'm going to go over here for a year, and then I'll go and do this. And he made these plans without ever considering God, and that got him into trouble. And sometimes we're so fixated on the future and the plans we have and the five and ten year plan. Don't get me wrong, those are really wise. You should have those. But sometimes we, we make those plans without ever considering God, without a, a dependence or reliance upon God. It's dependent and reliant upon my ability at my job, given the X amount of years and the seniority that I've built and everything that I've done to accomplish this. This is how we're going to get that. No, that's not true. So you could do the right things with the wrong heart and actually dishonor God. Every day, every day, the Lord provided every day to show them that life is not about this long, uh, this longevity of you can plan it where they want it to hoard. Hey, man, like me at, at that family dinner, right? I just want to take as much as I can to make sure I have enough with this scarcity mentality. And that's not what God teaches. He says every day, every day, go out and work, but look for it. Look for what I am going to give you. Look how I provide for you. Every day, without fail. Man. Give us this day our daily bread. The next thing I see that manna teaches us is that if we try to hoard God's provision, it spoils and rots. If we try to hoard God's provision, it spoils and rots. Look at verses 19 and 20. And Moses said to them, let no one leave any of it over to the morning. But they did not listen to Moses. Huh, interesting. Interesting. 
Some left part of it till the morning, and it bred worms and stank, and Moses was angry with them. I'm glad Moses got angry. It gives me, gives me freedom to get mad. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> Although he instructed them not to, to hoard it, um, but to take what they needed, uh, many had a scarcity mentality, and so they hoarded it, and it rotted. It wasn't good. It wasn't good. Ungrateful, unbelieving children who just took, there was this sense of scarcity, of greed, of selfishness. Ultimately, um, ultimately hoarding, greed, selfishness will lead to a spiritual stench. Hebrews 13, 5, it says, keep your life free from the love of money. And here's the key word, and be content. Be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Notice how the writer of Hebrews is turning it to not to your earthly possessions, but who is with you. See, because when you are focused on God, he leads you through the myth of not enough. He leads you out of that. But when you got your mind set, you got your eyes fixed on the wrong things, you're in trouble. Contentment says, I don't have enough. Or contentment doesn't say, I should say, I don't have enough. I need more. God, you failed me. Have you ever been there? Be honest, I know I've been there. I know I prayed those prayers. God, where are you? You're not doing anything. And maybe that prayer was from the wrong heart with an entitled mindset. But contentment says this. It does say these things. Thank you, God, for what I have. Thank you, God, for what I have. Your grace is sufficient. God, you are all I need. God, you are all I need. As I thought about that, this, this mentality that we can have, I thought about this song, and I'm going to play it for you guys. I don't know about you, but songs minister to me a lot. Anybody else here get ministered through songs? Yeah? I didn't get a chance to run through this this morning, so we'll see how this goes. Yeah. And I love this song. I love this song. I love the lyrics. Hopefully they're going to be on the screen. <coughs> and I'm battling some allergies, so we'll see. But just listen to the words. Listen to the words, and I love the chorus. All I need is you. And if this morning, and I, I, I thought about this song to encourage you, wherever you're at, whatever mindset you're in, whatever hardship you're in, can we look up instead of out? Can we do that? Left my fear by the side of the road To hear you speak and won't let go Fall to my knees as I lift my hands to pray Got every reason to be here again The Father's love that draws me in And all my eyes want to see is a glimpse of you All I need is you All I need is you, Lord, is you, Lord. All I need is you. All I need is you, Lord, is you, Lord. One more day and it's not the same. Your spirit calls my heart to sing. Drawn to the voice of my Savior once again. My soul be without your son you gave your life to save the earth i rest in the thought that you're watching over me yeah all i need is you oh. all i need is you lord is you lord all i need is you
wonder if we could just take a moment as we think about those words. God, all I need is you. Could we just pray that? Could we just take a moment just to close our eyes and fix our thoughts, our minds, our hearts, all of our affection on the Lord? Remind yourself and confess to the Lord that you need him. All I need is you. In every situation, and everything that's happening in my world, all I need is you. Far too often, it isn't that we don't have what we need. It's not that we don't have what we need. It's that we don't truly value the provision that we have. We don't truly value the provision that we do have. Luke 16.10 says this, that he who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. See, we mistakenly think that we would manage better if we had more money, right? How many know that's not true? It's just not true. I can't afford to tithe right now, right? This is what we tell ourselves. I can't afford to tithe right now, but if I, if I had more, I would, right? Right? I'm in debt because I don't make enough money. If I made more money, then I, would, I wouldn't be in debt. We need to start managing what we have right now. Or you probably will never be entrusted with more. In fact, Scripture says you won't be able to. See, I'm talking about the mindset that we have. I'm talking about what does manna teach us? What does God teach us about his provision? Point 84, which it seems like today, but I don't know. This is like point four, I think. Here's another thing that I see manna teaches us. It says that even, uh, even when we don't understand, we can choose to trust God. Even when we don't understand, we can choose to trust God. I'm going to skip down to verse 32, 31 and 32. So the, the Israelites are getting this manna. They don't, they don't know what it is, right? They're crying like babies in the wilderness, right? Complaining and grumbling, sticking their fists against God. You brought us out here to die. You should have just left us, Moses. Left us in Egypt where at least we had food. And let me die at the hands of the Lord there, right? Just this audacious talk. But all of a sudden, it starts raining bread. And they're like, what is this? And this is where we pick up. <clears throat> now, the house of Israel called its name manna. It was like coriander seed, white. And the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. And Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. Let an omer of it be kept throughout your generation so that they may see the bread with which I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. They complained. God showed them, let me show you how provision works. Let me show you how me being God Almighty actually works. Let me show you how really uh, uh, helpless you are for your own need. And he tells them, take this, 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 this thing that's falling from heaven, take an omer, and you're going to save it throughout the generations. So you can point back to it and say, this is what God saved us with. He fed us. He took care of us. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, maybe you know this verse. It's one of my favorite. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. They didn't quite understand what the manna was, but they were definitely eating it, right? You know how I know? Because they, they, they describe what it tastes like, <laughs> right? 
They didn't understand, okay, this is falling. God, how are you doing this? What is this? They didn't understand, but they definitely were eating it. They decided to trust God, and they were given a command so that they wouldn't forget the faithfulness of God. And I wonder, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder how many times in this room we have forgotten how God has been faithful. I wonder how many times we live through our life with this confusion, even though God has done so much for me. Man, I, can, man, I could go back to my earliest memories and talk about how God has provided, how he has provided, how he has always provided. And yet today, right, as a grown man, a father, a husband, I still fall into this mindset sometimes, like, God, are you going to do anything? Oh, my gosh. Right? I feel ashamed for, for even admitting that. But I wonder how much we forget. I wonder how much we forget. And we're sitting here, we live our lives, and we choose to live in this confusion or this chaos that asks the question, God will or would you do it again? Last thing, God provides in order to keep us committed to our highest priorities. Manna teaches us that God provides to keep us committed to our highest priorities. I'm going to go back to verse 21 and 26 through 26. It says, morning by morning they gathered it, each as much as he could eat. But when the sun grew hot, it melted, right? It didn't last. On the sixth day they gathered twice as much bread, two omers each. And when all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, he said to them, this is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is a, is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake and boil what you will boil and all that is left over lay aside to be kept to the morning. So they, set, so they laid it aside till the morning and Moses commanded them and uh, it did not stink and there was no worms in it. Moses said, eat it today for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it but on the seventh day which is a Sabbath there will be none. I think it's pretty cool that when they tried to hoard it throughout the week, when they tried to get ahead, when they tried to rob God, basically, or you have this entitlement mentality, it rotted. When they tried to hoard it and be selfish and greedy, it rotted. But when, it, when God says, this day I want you to rest, and I'm going to provide for you then too, oh my goodness. I mean, really, just a basic question, right? I'm thinking like a five-year-old. So wait a minute. It, it, it rotted every other day, but not on the seventh day. Why? Right? Well, because God said so. That's why. Because there is a plan to his madness of rest. He provides so that we keep the highest priorities. See, the Sabbath was set aside for worship and the things of God, so they rested from work. I wonder, how's your rest coming along? I'm, I'm preaching to the choir, man. I have pastors ask me, are you taking a day of rest? Are you taking a day of rest? Sometimes I'm like, ah, well, I mean, kind of, right? Like a full day of rest. I had moved it, you know. I had one day of the week, and I keep changing it. And I haven't been able to, you know, honestly, one full day of rest. I think we all struggle with that. I think we all struggle with that. Proverbs 3, 9 through 10. You want to run, write, this, uh, write this one down. Proverbs 3, 9 through 10. <clears throat> it says, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. Now, I'm not saying that this is, this is how you're going to get rich. I'm talking about when you honor the Lord and what he says, when you don't forget that he is the one who provides, when you are dependent upon him on a daily basis, not just when you're in need, but like I'm talking when things are, when you're on the mountaintop and everything's great, right? And the, and the bonuses come in and all the things are paid off and everything's great. You need God then too. Don't disregard him. But when you're in the valley low, and food is, is, is a scarcity. You're not sure how you're going to get there or how bills are going to get paid. It's a lot easier to depend on God then. But what about a consistent? What about every day? Every day. What if we, what if we chose to give God our first fruits, not our leftovers? Leftovers. 
Sometimes we want to give God what we want to give him and we want him to bless it. It doesn't work that way. It's not honoring to the Lord to give him sloppy seconds. We give to him our very best. We give to him first. We run to him. We don't run to anything else. We don't run to these hands. We don't run to this brain. We don't run to our energy or our networking abilities or our, or our education. We don't run to those things. We run to the person, to the God who provides. We run to the one who delivered us from slavery. We run to the one who opened up the Red Sea and we walked through on dry land. We run to that who vanquished our enemies. We run to him. And what would that look like this morning? Yeah, we're talking about money, but we're really talking about a mindset of worship. We're talking about a heart that honors God in all things, not just money. We're talking about stewarding a life that is actually uh, honoring to God. So I'm going to go ahead and invite the worship team back up, and we're also going to do something different. As I'm sure you noticed, we didn't collect our offering yet. Because I wanted to do it at the end. Because I want an, a personal application. I don't, I don't uh, one of the reasons... I get mad, especially when it comes to, you know, the church and then this, this stigma about money. It's like, oh, they just want your money. That's not really true, you know. This is our church. We're going to take care of it, right? That's what we're going to do. But really, really, uh, if, if you're not doing this for the right reasons, keep your money, please. Don't insult God thinking like you're tipping him or something. Because that's not what this is. This is an act of worship. And your mindset and how you do it means more than what you give, actually. More than what you give. And so I wanted to take a time where maybe, you know, uh, this is more symbolic of, of all of your income, not just your tithe. But if you got a wallet or purse or anything like that, just, just take it out. I want you to hold it in your hands. And I want you to listen to this statement, okay? I want you to take this statement as your own. In fact, I think next week I'll have it, I'll have it on the screen. I forgot to put it up there. But God is the ultimate source of all my resources. As you're holding your wallet and your purse in your hand, right, symbolizes your, your income, all right, uh, what you have to manage to steward. God is the ultimate source of all my resources. The way I manage my money and possessions is a reflection of my spiritual life. His plan is that I live in abundance and joy in every area of my life. I choose to break the cycle of scarcity that leads to selfishness, anxiety, greed, comparison, and fear. And I step into a life of generosity and God-given freedom. As we give this morning, right, there's tons of things that we can do. And each and every one of us is, is, uh, is a steward. We're managers of what God has entrusted to us. Someone on this side isn't going to tell someone on this side how they should do that. That is for you to do. And my encouragement to you is do it right. Do it in a way that honors the Lord. You know, it's, I'm not going to go around this week and check your bank statements. Your bank statements to make sure that you're doing it right, okay? This is between you and the Lord. It really is. Man, what if, what if what God gives me, right? He, he, he gives me what I need for the day. But he also gives me so that I could be generous. And we're going to be talking about this in the next couple weeks. It's one of the reasons why I'm choosing to do Angel Tree and the SOS Village to get us out of this building, to open up our wallets and go invest in somebody who really, really needs it. Do I have needs? Yeah. We may have needs in this church. And don't get me wrong, I have needs. But we will not be a needy church. We are going to be a church that blesses. We're going to be a church that that strives to manage what we've been given, uh, honoring to the Lord. Why? So that we can be the, the church he wants us to be. But it doesn't work unless you are on board. It doesn't work if you're, unless you're walking with us. So 
So I want you to just hold it in your hand. You don't have to lift it up or anything, but just hold your hand. If you're married, you're there with your spouse, you guys would just cover that. I'm just going to pray. And then uh, the worship team is going to lead us in a song. Heavenly Father, there are so many stories in this room, I'm sure, God, of how you provided, how you came down, how you made it rain manna in our lives in certain ways, God, when we didn't know what was going to happen. And Lord, I know too, God, that sometimes it's so easy for us to forget. So Lord, forgive us, God, if we've forgotten just how good you are, how faithful you are. And no matter what broken place we're in, no matter what uh, uh, scarcity place, no matter what desert we're in today, God, Lord, you can make it rain. You can provide. So, Lord, we don't run. We don't run to any uh, get-rich-quick schemes. We don't run to uh, even our own ability, our degrees, our networks, our resources. God, we run to you, God. We run to you, Lord. We open up our heart and our mind, God, and we make room for you, God, to come in. To come and do what only you can do. So, Lord, I pray, God, if, if we need conviction, convict us this morning. God, if we need encouragement, give us encouragement. God, if we need strength, God, give us strength. God, if we need wisdom to make better decisions, God, give us wisdom, Lord. So, Lord, that we can honor you, God, with the right mindset, Lord. Not a scarcity mindset, but an abundance that my Father in heaven provides. And he provides for me. So we give it to you, Lord, everything. Everything, we lay it down at your feet, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Right now, the usher is going to come and collect our offering. This is your act of worship. And after you've, after you've given your offering, if you want to stand and sing this song, it's a new song, but it's very pertinent to right now and to this moment.